The Prime Minister was heard, and I want to hear the Leader of the Opposition. I don't want people to turn up. You may disagree, but you will also may wish to catch my eye. Don't ruin that chance. Keir Starman. Mr Speaker, the Foreign Secretary Sheikh shouts now, but he stayed on holiday while our mission in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan was disintegrating. Mr Speaker, he did not even speak to ambassadors in the region as Kabul, as Kabul fell to the Taliban. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. You cannot coordinate an international response from the beach. A dereliction of duty by the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary, a, a government totally unprepared for the scenario that it had 18 months to prepare for. Mr Speaker, it's one thing for people to lose trust in the Prime Minister at home. But when the trust in the word of our Prime Minister is questioned abroad, there are serious consequences for our safety and security at home. Mr Speaker, in one moment, recent events in Afghanistan shame the West. Not just the scenes of chaos, but what it says about our abandonment of the Afghan people. For those brave people around the world, living under regimes paying scant regard to human rights, but resisting those regimes in pursuit of democracy, equality and individual freedom. What does this say to them? What does this retreat from freedom signal to those prepared to stand up for it? What does this surrender to extremism mean for those prepared to face it down? And what does it mean for those nations who support an international rules-based system when we hand over power to those who recognise no rules at all. That is the challenge of our time. Mr Speaker, the British and Afghan people will have to live with the consequences of the Prime Minister's failure. We have fought for 20 years to rid Afghanistan of terror, terror which threatens our security here in Britain and liberty in Afghanistan. The Taliban are back in control. The Prime Minister has no plan how to handle the situation, just as he had no plan to prevent it. What we've won through 20 years of sacrifice could all be lost. That is the cost, Mr Speaker, of careless leadership. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Theresa May. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I had the opportunity to visit Afghanistan twice, but I recognise that there are others across this House whose experience is more recent, more vivid, more practical, longer and broader than mine. But when I was there, I was struck by the commitment and dedication of our armed forces serving there and of other British personnel. All were doing what they could to give hope to the people of Afghanistan, people who, thanks to our presence, were able to enjoy freedoms they had been denied under the Taliban. Twenty years on, 457 British military personnel have died in Afghanistan, and many more have suffered life-changing injuries. Yes, many girls have been educated because of British aid, but it is not just that the freedoms once enjoyed will now be taken away, but there are many, many Afghans, not just those who worked with British forces, who are now in fear of their lives. It is right that we should open up a refugee scheme, but we must make it absolutely certain that it is accessible to all those who need it. Now, of course, the NATO presence was always going to end at some point in time, but the withdrawal when it came was due to be orderly, planned and on the basis of conditions. It has been none of these. What has been most shocking has been the chaos and the speed of the takeover by the Taliban. In July of this year, both President Biden and my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, indicated that they did not think that the Taliban was ready or able to take over control of the country. Was our intelligence really so poor? Was our understanding of the Afghan government so weak? Was our knowledge of the position on the ground so inadequate? Or did we really believe this? Or did we just feel that we had to follow the United States 
and hope that on a wing and a prayer it would be all right on the night. Because the reality is, if I may just make this point, the reality is that as long as this a time limit was given and dates were given for withdrawal, all the Taliban had to do was to ensure there were sufficient problems for the Afghan government not to be able to have full control of the country and then just sit and wait. Would my right honourable friend agree that President Biden decided unilaterally to withdraw without agreeing and negotiating a plan with either the Afghan government or the NATO allies? And the response of the UK government in the circumstances has been fast, purposeful, and extremely, extremely well guided to protecting the interests of UK citizens. Can I just say to my right honourable friend that what President Biden has done is upheld a decision that was made by President Trump. It was a unilateral decision of President Trump to do a deal with the Taliban that has led to this withdrawal. And of course, what we've seen from the scenes in Afghanistan is that it hasn't been all right on the night. As I say, there are many in Afghanistan who fear not just that their lives will be irrevocably changed for the worse, but who fear for their lives. Numbered among them will be women. Women who embrace freedom, embrace the right to education, to work and to participate in the political process. My right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, was right to make the education of girls a key aim of his administration. But in Afghanistan, that will now be swept away. Those girls who have been educated will have no opportunity to use that education. The Taliban proclaim that women will be allowed to work and girls will be allowed to go to school. But this will be under Islamic law, or rather under their interpretation of Islamic law. And we, if I may just, and we have seen before what that means for the lives of women and girls. Are you ready? I'm very grateful. My right honourable friend, give, give, give away on that point. Some of the women who show most courage are the 250 women who serve as judges uh, under the attempt that was made to impose a decent, honest legal system on, on Afghanistan. They are particularly feared as being targets. The Bar Council and the Law Society have asked the government to particularly take a cognizance of the particular risks that they run. Will she support the court for them to be given particular priority in being brought to safety? Because they put their lives on their line for their fellow women and for their whole country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very important point. As has been said, there are many groups in Afghanistan who have actually put their lives on the line to, to support the Afghan government, to support democracy, to support justice in Afghanistan. And it is right that we should do everything that we can to support them in their time of need. But as we know, under the, I may just make a further point about women and girls. As we know, under the Taliban regime, sadly, the life of women and girls will not be the same. They will not have the rights that we believe they should have, and they will not have the freedoms that they should have. I give way to the honourable lady. Okay. There are already reports from um, sources in Kabul that the Taliban is executing collaborators and homosexuals. It, does she agree with me that complacency is absolutely misplaced? And what does she suggest should we do to protect those people who need to get out? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, can I say to the Honourable Lady that the government is doing much to protect people in trying to ensure that it is possible for people to be able to access uh, ways of leaving Afghanistan. Now, I think a point was made earlier about the issue of not just expecting people to get to Kabul, and I hope that this is something that the government will be able to look into and be able to take up. Uh, furthermore, apart from the impact on people's lives in terms of women and girls, we do see potential humanitarian crisis, uh, at least in some parts of Afghanistan. Now, of course, we cut our international aid budget, but I'm pleased that uh, the Foreign Secretary has told me that more funding is going to be made available to uh, deal with this, uh, with this crisis. But it isn't just about the impact of the people on Afghanistan that must concern us. We must be deeply concerned about the possible impact here in the UK. The aim of our involvement in Afghanistan was to ensure that it could not be used as a haven for terrorists. Terrorists who could train, plot and encourage and tax here in the UK. Al-Qaeda Al has not gone away. Daesh may have lost their ground in Syria. But these terrorist groups remain and they have spurned, spawned others. We will not defeat them until we have defeated the ideology which feeds their extremism. 
Thank you, my wife, my friend, for giving way. She concerned. I mean, one of the most concerning things that's happening is that several half thousand um, Al Qaeda operatives have been freed from Bagram prison, from Kabul prison, from Kandahar. Does she think? Does she is she concerned that these people are going to go back to their own old ways, or do we hope that they're somehow going to go into retirement? Because it seems to me that we are going to restart a new round of international terrorism. Well, my, my, my honourable friend has actually anticipated a point I was exactly about to make, which is the Taliban, of course, have said that they will not allow Afghanistan to become a haven for terrorists again. Uh, yesterday in the press conference, they said they would not allow uh, anything to happen in Afghanistan which led to attacks elsewhere across the world. But the, their actions must be what we look at, not their words. And their action has, as my honourable friend has just pointed out, been to release thousands of high-value Taliban, Al-Qaeda and Daesh fighters. So their action is completely different from their words. And I think it is absolutely essential for us to uh, recognise that the probability that Afghanistan will once again become a breeding ground for the terrorists who seek to destroy our way of life. I Thank you for giving way because she's making exactly the point I hoped to hear from the Prime Minister and didn't. The reasons that we went into Afghanistan in 2002 remain valid today. If the actions that have been taken in recent weeks <laughs> render a military solution to that problem impossible, then we have to have a non military solution. What does she see that non military solution as being? To the right honourable gentleman, I'm going to make a reference uh, later on to this issue. I think that, that it is, he is absolutely right that the uh, question of a military solution has not been there actually for some time because our combat mission ended some years ago. But what we have been doing is trying to provide the support to enable a democratic government to actually take, uh, take uh, uh, c proper control of that country. Uh, I'd be happy to talk to the right honourable gentleman at some time about my views, but actually, I think that. The idea of imposing Western, trying to impose just a Western example of democracy, actually in a country which is geographically difficult and which relies a lot on, on uh, regional uh, uh, government, is act possibly was a, a route that we should have reconsidered when we were going down that route. But I will not go down that, uh, that road any longer, uh, uh, despite his temptations. But there was another... Uh, would the about the time for backbench. I did suggest it was seven minutes. We're now heading to ten. I didn't put a time limit on, but I'm going to have to do after this. Mr. Speaker, I'm very grateful for, for uh, your generosity to me. For the UK, there was another important element of our work in Afghanistan. That was stopping the drugs from coming into the United Kingdom. Yeah. Sadly, that has not been as successful as we would have liked it to be. But we did uh, support a drug crime-specific criminal justice system in Afghanistan. I assume that is now going to come to a complete end. So, once again, this is another area where withdrawal is not just about Afghanistan, it has an impact on the streets of the UK. But what must also be of key concern to us is the message this sends around the world to those who would do the West harm. Mm -hmm. The message it sends about our capabilities and, most important, about our willingness to defend our values. Mm -hmm. What does it say about us as a country? What does it say about NATO if we are entirely dependent on a unilateral decision taken by the United States. We all understand the importance of American support, but despite the comments from my right honourable friend earlier, I do find it incomprehensible and worrying that the United Kingdom was not able to bring together not a military solution, but an alternative alliance of countries to continue to provide the support necessary to sustain a government in Afghanistan. Surely one outcome of this must be a reassessment of how NATO operates. NATO is the bedrock of European security, but Russia will not be blind to the implications of this withdrawal decision and the manner in which it has been taken. Neither will China and others have failed to notice the implications, because in recent years the West has appeared to be less willing to defend its values. This cannot continue, because if it does, it will embolden those who do not share those values and wish to impose their way of life on others. I'm afraid I think this has been a major setback for British foreign policy. We boast about Global Britain, but where is Global Britain on the streets of Kabul? Mm. A successful foreign policy strategy will be judged by our deeds, not by our words. And I finally just say this. All of our military personnel, all who served in Afghanistan, 
should hold their heads high yeah. and be proud yeah. of what they achieved in that country over 20 years, of the change of life they brought to the people of Afghanistan and the safety they brought here to the UK. The politicians sent them there. The politicians decided to withdraw. The politicians must be responsible for the consequences. Leader of the SNP, Ian Blackford. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And can I begin by thanking you for facilitating the recall of, of Parliament? It's a pleasure to follow the Right Honourable Member for Maidenhead, and I hope that the Government will reflect very carefully on, on her words this morning, and particularly her remarks at the end of her contribution about the role of NATO in the light of the American decision to pull out of Afghanistan, because these are very real issues about the capabilities that we have within NATO, and if I may say so, not just about the capability of NATO, but how we make sure that the United Nations has all the tools at its disposal in order to do what we expect of it as well. And these are matters that we are going to have to return to in this House uh, when we come back from recess. Mr Speaker, I would like to thank the Government for the briefings that we have had over the course of the last few days, and I, in particular I want to commend the Defence Secretary for making himself available in the way that he has conducted himself. And indeed, that is also true of ministers in the Home Office, and I'm thinking particularly of the member for Torbay, and in the Foreign Office, the uh, member for Braintree, because it is important when we're talking about human lives being lost that when it is possible that in this House that we work together, but yes, of course, that we ask legitimate questions. Mr Speaker, there can be little doubt that the chaos and the crisis being inflicted upon the Afghan people is the biggest foreign policy failure of modern times. The sheer scale of that political failure is only matched by the 